G'day and welcome back to Chalk Talks, where I discuss blacksmithing, bladesmithing, metallurgy and more. Today, we're discussing handle design. In the previous episode of Chalk Talks, we discussed the construction of handles. But a well-constructed handle can still have a poor design and therefore isn't comfortable to use or doesn't look aesthetically pleasing with the overall design of the knife. So I decided that the next episode should be a discussion about the design of a handle surrounding the construction rather than just the construction. Now I think it's important at the beginning of this episode to talk about the fact that form always follows function, never becomes before it. Uh, in so many designs that I've seen of handles, people tend to overdo the form in place of the function and that kind of ruins the knife. The knife is primarily a tool and any kind of tool needs to be comfortable to the user and strong enough to do the task that it's designed for. So when designing a handle, this equation, <laughs> if you like, is very important. In saying that, construction and design are not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? Construction does not always necessarily dis, uh, decide what design you use, and the design doesn't necessarily decide what construction you use. In some cases, that will be the case, but a lot of the times you can adapt the construction to your design or vice versa. So we'll go into a couple of examples of that. A prime example of the construction and design not being mutually exclusive is in through tangs, right? Now, through tangs do not always necessitate a dead straight tang. In most beginners and uh, in a lot of traditional knife making, tangs were almost dead straight, especially in things like the Scandinavian Puko, of which this is a representative copy of. But also in modern hunting knife designs and fighting knife designs, you'll find that a lot of uh, through tangs are curved. Uh, sometimes peened or sometimes threaded, sometimes, you know, they've got a manipulable joint here in the handle to just give that little bit more adjustment to the uh, angle of the butt. But in the end, this, if these are both the same construction, but very wildly different in design. So make sure that when you're designing your knife, you keep in mind that the design doesn't necessarily have to fit the construction you want to use. So the first example of knife design that I've decided to show, the handle design at least, is the very simple Japanese style stick tang fit that you'll find on most uh, beginner knife makers kitchen knives and even like professional knife maker kitchen knives that is incredibly simple because it's simply just a stick, it's like a broom handle. There are many variations all in cross section rather than in uh, overall profile. And this is a really good place to start trying to play with different uh, cross-sectional differences rather than profile differences when you're getting started. You can do things like the very traditional WA or D style handle which is uh, faceted at the top and then rounded at the bottom. You could do a full octagonalized handle, uh, you could do hexagonal or you could do a, an ovate handle. It doesn't really matter what you choose but the difference in overall cross-section is actually going to inform the use of the knife. It's actually going to feel different in the hand. It's going to look different visually, especially if you are using certain materials that can really help show through really good grain structure, say if you use a faceted finish. So when you start designing your handle, one of the things you need to think about is the cross-section as well as the profile. So many people start with the profile and move to cross-section after. I think it should be the other way around. And so this is a really good place to start. I personally prefer making the faceted, fully octagonal handles. Sometimes I'll make a WA or D style handle. I very rarely use the ovate handles on this style of knife, purely because I find it to be a little bit dull and a little bit uninteresting to the eye when making the knife. It also feels slightly different in the hand to what I want in a knife. And that will come down to personal preference and, you know, again, the materials you're using. And that's going to come into a big play when designing a knife handle is what materials are you using. Sometimes you're going to have a design of a knife before you have the, over the material you're going to use for the handle, in which case you then have to use that design knowledge to inform your choice of material. Otherwise, you might have a piece of material that you want to turn into a handle for a knife, 
and you're going to have to make, let that material decide the size and shape of your handle, especially if you've only got a certain amount of stock. But yeah, when starting out, I suggest making knives like this and trying the different profiles, understanding the impact that uh, your cross-section has on the feel of a knife more than the profile, because profile is slightly more complicated and also is informed by cross-sectional differences. You can have these same cross-sectional shapes in full-profiled handles. Now let's move to that. When designing on a handle profile, a lot of it comes down to use and what it's actually going to be used for. Now, in a hunting knife, you may want slight profile changes, uh, you know, a slight belly to accommodate the fingers, uh, but you want a relatively sleek and even handle purely for a carrying one, and also so that you can reverse your grip on the knife relatively easily in order to cut upwards and stuff like that. It doesn't need to be overly complex in its form in profile. Whereas in something like a fighting knife, for instance, you may have a very ergonomically shaped handle in order to better fit that hand to keep it on the handle when going through heavy cuts and things like that. Especially when we're considering, you know, the hand is going to be receiving the shock from the impact of the blade on, say, a hard target. Maybe that ergonomic shape is going to help you. These two designs are both ch changing in profile, but they can also change in cross-section. A simple addition of some facets completely changes the look of the knife, basically just through lines. It makes it seem more sleek, more streamlined, especially if the lines follow the, um, the design. The same thing goes here. Uh, Nick Wheeler quite famously has a an ovate flat section on his, and then the handle pieces are concave. And so he uses these facets, these changes in shape and in, uh, in overall cross section to provide edge alignment and comfortability in his knives. Will Stelter quite famously uses facets to great effect on his hunters and stuff like that. And it doesn't require a really out there profile in order to provide that effect. Uh, Heisenberg Knives is another one that does a really good job of this. But when you come to profile, don't go too hardcore on your profiles unless it's going to like, directly affect the use of the knife. I've seen quite a few knife makers who will use this fighter style handle on something like a hunter or a kitchen knife even, and it directly inhibits the way that the knife handles um, and really just makes the knife not a great knife for the purpose that it was supposed to be built for. Now, when designing a handle, you have to keep in mind the blade. And in an, the next episode, actually, I'm going to be talking about overall knife design, but handle design is directly informed by the blade. So make sure that the handle is going to suit the use, the purpose that it's designed for. Now, moving on from cross-sectional and profile designs, we want to talk about the main three attributes of a handle that will decide its comfortability and all of that. And that is its length, its width, and its breadth. Now, when discussing length, obviously, the handle length is simply the length from the guard to the pommel, right? Very simple. The breadth, or the, uh, sorry, the width is in cross section this dimension. And the breadth is obviously this dimension, or the depth of the handle. In almost all knife handles, in pretty much all knife handles, the breadth or depth should be larger than the width of your knife because you want to provide edge alignment. And edge alignment comes from feeling where the edge is in the hand. So you should be able to close your eyes whilst holding the knife and know exactly where the edge is on your knife purely by the shape of the handle. Whether that be ovate or faceted or any other style of uh, cross-section, you should be able to tell 
where your edge is going. And that is so that when you're using it, perhaps in a situation where you can't see the knife, if you're cutting around inside uh, an animal or something like that, if you're, if you're uh, using it for skinning or something like that, you need to be able to tell where your edge is on the knife before even looking at the knife. This is immediately negated by using perfectly round handles because they don't actually give you any edge alignment. And so the handle could be upside down or sideways and you wouldn't know if you weren't looking at it. It also doesn't provide any kind of connection to the knife. The, the handle can free spin in your hand, whereas an ovate cross section is going to stick in the hand in that groove between the thumb and forefinger. What we want is to create a, a lock for that to happen. That being said, a perfectly rectangular handle, whilst cross-sectionally deeper than it is wide, is going to be uncomfortable because the hand is not naturally rectangular. It doesn't create right angles. And so it's going to feel uncomfortable. If you want flat planes, that's when you go to your octagonal and you take that corner off to provide that extra roundness for the hand to fit in and feel comfortable. When it comes to length, there is such a thing as too long a handle, but there's also too thing, such a thing as too short a handle. Uh, for the most of the knives that I make, my handles are between four and a half and five inches long. Uh, the reason for that is obviously because it fits the majority of hands. My hand is one of the largest that I know, and I fit a five inch handle quite comfortably. Four and a half, I'm kind of putting my pinky right on that edge of the pommel. Um, and so therefore, I'm going to want a slightly larger handle. A five and a half inch handle will suit me just fine. But for the majority of users, anywhere between four and a half and five inches, so uh, about 112.5 to 125 is about right. Yeah, I believe. I'm doing my math in my head. Um, is about right for most handle designs. And that doesn't matter the size of the blade. One of the things that I see a lot of is that people will use small handles on small blades. And in cases of things like neck knives and stuff like that, that makes sense. But in most knives, even wood carving knives and stuff like that, you still want that full-sized handle in order to have all of your hand engaging the handle that's controlling the blade. You need that control. So your length is a fairly set measure. Your width, I tend to go around an inch wide maximum. Uh, most of my handles are about 20 mil, which is about three eighths, uh, sorry, three quarters of an inch um, in width. And in depth, I'll normally go for about an inch to up to about an inch and a quarter, 32 mil. Um, again, it will be informed by my overall design. And if I'm recreating something, I may just follow the design parameters of that. But that tends to be my average. So again, if we were to draw a rectangle, this maximum would be 32 mil. And um, this maximum here would be 20 ish. 25 at the absolute maximum for very large knives. And these two kind of inform each other. You don't want a super narrow handle that is also very deep. You also don't want a very wide handle that is very shallow. Again, you don't want to create a square or a circle. So if the thinner this gets, the shallower this gets normally, because it just aids in comfortability. Sometimes you'll have to design it to the customer's hand, and that's something that comes with custom knife making. As custom knife makers, that's what we do. But if you're just making knives for general purpose, these are the measurements that I've found suit most people. Uh, in actual fact, this one would be more like 25 to 20, um, but 32 is an absolute maximum. I have made one that had 36 mil high, which is uh, close to like two inches, <laughs> like close to an uh, uh, inch and a half. And uh, that was ridiculous. It was just, it was just too thick, uh, even for me, even too, uh, too deep, even for me. So when you are deciding your shape of your handle, keep these measurements in mind. Before you design the handle, make sure that you have at least your length down for your profile, and then your width and breadth are going to decide your cross-section. 
When designing knives these days, I design my profile and my cross section before I even start the build. And that's so it informs me of what materials I can use when I'm selecting my handle blocks and stuff like that. Because if the handle block I want to use for a handle is only four inches long, it's not gonna make a four and a half to five inch handle. <laughs> so I may have to end up stacking material on to the end or making a pommel cap or making a ferrule uh, before the guard. And that's purely to add that length for the handle. If I want a handle that is going to be, you know, 32 mil deep at the butt and, you know, tapering up, which is the next thing we'll talk about, then I need something that's going to be that wide at the butt. <laughs> and so therefore, if the block that I have isn't 32 mil wide anywhere, it's not going to make the handle material that I want to make. So make sure you keep these three measurements in mind when designing your handle. So one of the other things to keep in mind with knife design is tapers. Now we've already discussed distal taper and profile taper in blades in a previous episode of Chalk Talks, but the handle also should taper in most cases. There are some historical examples that do not have any taper, but most modern knives and even many of the traditional knives of which this one is a very overdramatized version of had tapers. And much unlike the blades, which taper away from the hand, these ones taper into the hand. So what we're talking about is flaring out from the guard portion or from the tang shoulders out to the butt. And the reason for that is, of course, because if we are swinging the knife or if we're using the knife in any way, the friction is on the blade end, which is drawing the knife out of our hand. And so having a taper wedges itself into our hand rather than slipping out of it. There are some exceptions to this rule. I've seen some kitchen knives that taper backwards away from uh, the hand. Um, so they'll taper from the tang shoulders down to the, to the handle. I'm not a massive fan of that um, in most cases, but you know some people like that for artistic design and that'll be up to you and what you're making and what the, you're designing. But the other advantage of this tapering, right, not only in profile, but also in thickness, that is very important, is that it also provides extra balance, especially for knives, the knives that you're using for fighting or knives that you're using in, you know, kitchen cook, cooking and stuff like that. Having a little bit of extra mass at the rear ends up counterbalancing the weight of your blade. Now, and obviously in a short puka like this, that's not important. Uh, and it's more for comfortability than anything else. But in something like a kitchen knife, that can be incredibly important for the feel of the weight of the knife. If the blade feels overly heavy because the handle is quite slim, then it can feel clunky in the hand, no matter how good the cutting geometry is. So having a flare is incredibly important in your handle, even a traditional ovate handle like this Puko, but it becomes even more important in modern style knives. So in modern knives, especially fighting knives and stuff like that, this is incredibly important because you are swinging that knife and normally you have quite a heavy blade attached. And so that blade could go flying if it's just an ovate cylinder <laughs> throwing, <laughs> throwing away from you, tapering away from the handle. But you'll notice, and this is way over dramatized <laughs> for, for the uh, purposes of this video, in profile, there is a taper from here out to there, and from here out to there. There is a natural taper, even though the handle is curved, there is still a taper of width, uh, of depth from there to here. There is quite a significant difference between those two measurements. But also in profile on from the top, right, if we're talking about width, there is a distinct taper from there to the butt, and it's almost a straight line. When you, when you normally make your handle blocks for fighting knives like this, you will make the handle block not square, but tapered. You'll first establish your tapers, much like when you're forging the preform for a knife before you forge bevels. You will establish your tapers and then cut in your handle grooves for you know, that, that ergonomic grip. So when I'm establishing my handle block, my handle block will simply look like a wedge like this from the top and from the side, just fitting that design in. Obviously, it's going to be slightly more tapered in profile than it will width-wise, but I'm providing my tapers so that when I start grinding in my grooves and my, my ergonomics and all that kind of stuff, 
I've already got all of the tapers established for when it's finally finished. I can start with a square block, and that's a good way to start to mark your center line to then mark your tapers. And I would highly suggest marking your center lines uh, and marking your tapers later. But you can always mark your center lines with your tapers by just measuring the width and then marking center and then obviously drawing a line between those two center points. But these tapers not only provide that extra security in the swing, but they're more comfortable because the hand naturally grips this way. It grips with the forefinger first and then the pinky fingers. So the pinky fingers almost always end up uh, slightly wider in the grip than they do uh, when they're fully closed. And so therefore, all of the narrow point is going to be gripped quite firmly by the, the pointer finger. And that means that a, a flared grip like this is always going to feel a little bit more comfortable than a just a straight broomstick grip, as you will find in many things. So when establishing your knife block before you go to making an ergonomic design like this, make sure you have your tapers set. Otherwise, you're going to end up chasing the taper whilst also trying to grind grooves into it, which is a massive pain, and I don't suggest it. In closing, there aren't any serious hard and fast rules when it comes to handle design, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what you should be thinking about when you're making a handle for a knife, making sure that the ergonomics fit with the function of the knife, but also with the aesthetics of the knife, making sure that if you're making a very traditional style of knife, that you may want to go for a more traditional handle style, slightly less uh, contoured and stuff like that. But maybe you want to make a fusion design, and so that's why there's no real hard and fast rule, as I said. Uh, like, I like to make my uh, wah-style handles on Bowie knives, because I like doing that little bit of fusion of the Japanese and American culture uh, into a knife, and I really like the way that comes out. But when it comes to handle design, there are a certain few rules that you can follow that will help you get to a decent design without needing to really work too hard at studying every design available to you on the market. And that's just following that length, width, and breadth uh, argument, and also making sure that you've got your nice tapers in there. When, I come, when it comes to handle design, I have seen new handles every year that I have never thought would work, but work. Uh, and so therefore, I'm not going to tell you how to make your handles, but these are the rules that have helped me in my handle construction and will continue to help me in the future. Um, I really want to say a huge thank you to my patrons who allow this kind of content to be made. Um, without them, I would not be continuing to do this kind of stuff for the educational content that I have. Uh, if you want to join this group of fantastic people over here, there is a link down in the description below. There'll also be a link in the tag at the end of this video. Um, and they get access to behind the scenes videos and all kinds of fun stuff as well. Um, <clears throat> but if you liked this kind of content and you want to see more of it, make sure to hit the like button and then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell icon to be notified of when I upload new videos. I'm trying to upload a new video every week. And if you have an idea that you want to see in a Chalk Talk video, just leave it down in the comment section down below or just say hi. I always like hearing from my subscribers. <laughs> With that being said, guys, I hope you have a fantastic week. Get out to your shop. Make something fun. Uh, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And if you do, make sure you film it. I'll see you next time.